Hi, everyone. In this short lecture, what I want to do is take some of the material we've developed about uh, group theory and specifically about permutations to talk about a few fun puzzles. And before I jump into the examples, let me tell you what my two main references for these topics are. Uh, the first is this book by Jamie Mulholland called Permutation Puzzles, A Mathematical Perspective. This book is extremely comprehensive. It's 331 pages long, and it has sections on everything that I'll talk about, and then also a lot more. Uh, another thing that's really helpful here is that uh, this book comes out of a course that Professor Mulholland has taught, and the course website has a bunch of applets where you can play these different kinds of puzzles online and interact with them. So the other main reference that I have is notes by Keith Conrad on the 15 puzzle and the Rubik's cube. So I'll put a link to both of these and all of the other uh, resources for this video into uh, the summary of lectures page on the course website. So the first thing I want to do is get started by talking about the 15 puzzle. So I'm just showing you here that this is the class web page related to the 15 puzzle from uh, Professor Mulholland's class on permutation puzzles in mathematics. So let's just jump in and play around with it. So how does it work? You have this puzzle, and they make physical versions of this that has these 15 uh, square blocks, and then it has a blank. And the rule is that you can exchange the blank with any up, down, left, right adjacent square in the puzzle. So like you can slide the 15 into the blank, and then you can slide the 11 down into the blank, and then the 12, and then the 15. And what we've seen now is you know, we did a couple of moves, a couple of slides, and the blank is in the same place, but we've permuted the 11, 12, and the 15. We keep going around. We can unscramble back to where we started. So the classical uh, thing that you do with this puzzle is you shuffle it around or you have a friend shuffle it around and then you wanna make moves to get it back to its one through 15 with the blank in the corner uh, original setting. And I'm not particularly good at this. So I'm gonna move things around a little bit, get my numbers into the right neighborhood and then uh, I'm going to quit and give up out of frustration. So here we go. We put this three over here. Maybe move this here. Maybe I can get at least a row correct or something like that, right? Here we go. One, two, three, four. Now I feel like I'm in business. Here we go. Maybe it doesn't seem that way, but this is actually kind of fun. Uh, no, it, of course it seems fun. This is fun. Let's see. Oh, I got to get this five over here, figure out what I'm doing with myself. Okay, five, six, seven. Let me bring the seven around the other way. Oh no, I've made it worse. I've made it worse. Am I winning? I don't know. I don't even know anymore. Nope, didn't want to do that. So you get the idea, hopefully. Uh-oh, the eight and the seven are switched. Seven, eight, bring the eight around a different way. Oh no. Okay, so now I'm gonna give up. So uh, anyway, I hope you get the idea for how this puzzle works. And uh, one easy way to go back to the original setting is just reload this page. So this went through a sort of craze uh, a long time ago where uh, people got hooked on the 15 puzzle, and there was a challenge that was set that what you should do is start with the regular 15 puzzle, switch the 15 and the 14 tile, and now get it back to the original solved state. And there was a mathematician who offered a prize, or a mathematician slash puzzle creator who offered a prize and said, I'll give you $1,000 if you can solve this and explain how you did it. And the punchline is uh, no one claimed the prize because it is impossible. And you can use a little bit of the group theory that we've developed 
with the symmetric group to see why this is the case. So what's going on? You can think of these 16, these 15 blocks. Let me go back to the original. You can think of these 15 squares together with the blank as 16 things that get permuted when you move blocks around. So let's just call the blank the number 16. So what have we done? We've taken the thing that started in position 11 and sent it to position 15. We've taken the thing that started in position 12 and sent it to position 11. We've taken the thing that started in position 15 and sent it to position 12. And then the 16 ends up back where it is. So in this way, you can understand the set of all configurations that you can reach in the 15 puzzle as being uh, a subset of S16, the symmetric group on 16 elements. So going back, what's really happening in the 1514 puzzle is you have uh, these 15 numbered blocks, and then you have the blank. So one thing you could consider is not all the symmetric, all the uh, permutations of these 16 elements, but the subset of them that leave the blank in the lower right corner. So you move everything around, the blank is somewhere, and then you slide the blank back into the lower right corner. And what have we got? Now we've got a permutation in S15. So which permutations in S15 do you actually get? For example, can you get the one that is just the transposition 1514? And uh, I'll let you think about it, and I'll point you to these references. But the end result is no. You don't get every permutation in S15. You exactly get A15. You get the subgroup of even permutations. And one way, let me say this a little informally to understand what's going on, is every move is a transposition of 16 elements. right? So in S16, you're getting this transposition uh, where I'm taking the the transposition that I'm getting, if you write a permutation as a product of all of the moves so far, the important thing is not to say, OK, now I'm switching the blank and uh, the thing in position two. The fact that the blank is in position three now is not the most useful way to think about this. It's more useful to say that this move that I'm doing right now is switching the thing in position three and the thing in position two. Now I'm going to switch the thing in position one and the thing in position two, the thing in position one and the thing in position five. And in this way, you can see that every move uh, is going to be a transposition. And it's a transposition of the two places whose occupants you are switching. So. For this question about the subset of things that put the blank back in the lower right corner, well, every transposition involves the blank. And if you start in the lower right corner and you end in the lower right corner, you have to go up and down the same number of times. So the number of up and down transpositions has to be even. At the end of the day, you can go up and down and up and down and up and down, but there's an even number of up down transpositions. Same thing with left-right transpositions. Left and right, left and right, maybe you go up and down. But if you end up back with the blank in the lower right corner, there's an even number of these transpositions. So that's a very informal explanation for why the set of permutations you get is contained in A15. And to show that you actually get all of A15, you want to do something like show that you get a set of permutations that generates A15. And we know things like A15 is generated by all of the three cycles. But in fact, just like SN is generated by all transpositions, it's even generated by the much smaller set of adjacent transpositions that switch I and I plus 1. So you can show that there is a more compact generating set for A15 made up only of some of the three cycles. And in Conrad's notes, there's a detailed explanation for how you get uh, all of them by looking at certain combinations of 
uh, these puzzle moves that are called moves that give you certain permutations. OK, so I'm going to pause. And then uh, I'll transition from talking about the 15 puzzle to talking about the Rubik's Cube. So let's talk about the Rubik's Cube. Here's an online Rubik's Cube simulator. I'll put a link in the chat. How does a Rubik's Cube work? Well, you have this cube, and it's really got six sides and nine of these squares on each side. You can flip it over and look at what you get. And there are certain moves that you can do, like you can take a face and rotate it 90 degrees. Or you could take uh, a slice in the middle and rotate it 90 degrees. Or you could take uh, you know, one of the other faces. Here I'm rotating the down face. And there's this neat uh, like keyboard shortcuts that explain like which button does which Rubik's Cube move. But there are all these moves. And they move around the cubes uh, on the Rubik's Cube. And the goal is you start with each one of the faces is a solid color. You scramble the Rubik's Cube around, and you want to end up back in the case where each one of the faces is a solid color. So what's going on here? There are these uh, nine uh, stickers, nine little squares on each of the six sides. So there are these 54 um, uh, objects. And as you do Rubik's Cube moves, you are permuting them around. And you can see that like when you rotate a face a quarter of the way, if you do that four times, you come back to where you started. So that's some permutation of these 54 elements um, that has order four. So let's think about what happens as you uh, do these different Rubik's Cube moves. As you do some of these moves, you're moving like uh, the, the sides, the corner pieces, uh, whatever. But if you think about the six center pieces, no matter which Rubik's Cube moves you do, there's always going to be exactly one of those uh, six colors on each of the six center faces that you can think about moving uh, moving all of the Rubik's Cube moves around. And these six center squares are really kind of fixed in a way that the other 48 are not. So you can think about it and convince yourself that, in fact, you're not getting any permutation of the 54 squares on the Rubik's Cube, but the six center ones are treated uh, differently. And even more than that, you can think about certain restrictions that occur. Like for each of these uh, corner cubes, when you do a move, where does it go? It goes to another one of the eight corner cubes. Why eight? There are four on the top layer and four on the bottom layer, and that's it. So you have these, uh, these cubies, which are the little cubes that make up the Rubik's Cube. The uh, six center cubies don't move. Um, or they don't move in the same way anyway. Um, you have these eight uh, corner ones. And then the rest are these uh, one, two, three, four on the front face, four on the back face, middle cubies. And then there's also four in the middle face. So there's these 12 middle cubies. So you can ask questions like, is it possible? Now, keeping track of more than just the colors, but numbering all of these um, uh, cube, little cubies from uh, 1 to 54, all of the cube ed, uh, faces, the squares, is it possible to have something where you like move everything around, and then all you've done is put this cubie in the same spot, but now with the blue and the orange switched? So there are certain kinds of moves that you can show uh, don't happen. And I'll let you think about that one. And to give you an idea of what goes into this kind of analysis, there's this really um, 
detailed, extensive notation for Rubik's cube moves. So uh, this is this sing master notation where it classifies all of the different kinds of moves and you can write um, permutations as compositions of these moves. There's the front face, back face, right face, left face, up face, and down face. Um, you can see unfolded uh, sticker labelings. And, um, and yeah, you can see all this terminology. So I will admit somewhat embarrassingly that I have never learned to solve a Rubik's cube. It's definitely something I should do. My brother was very into these kinds of puzzles at, when we were growing up as kids and I never wanted to compete with him unless I was gonna win. And he was clearly going to crush me at Rubik's cube. So I never learned how to do it. Um, in the, the, this book, there's a ton of stuff about Rubik's cubes. In Conrad's notes, there's a much shorter discussion, but still gets to some highlights that you might want to check out. It also has some neat pictures of the inner workings um, of a Rubik's cube. So uh, here are all of these basic moves in permutation cycle notation. And the question is, what is the subgroup generated by all of these moves, by these permutations? And you can uh, compute what it is and compute its order that it's this, uh, yeah, that it's this special, very large subgroup of the group of all permutations. So I'll point out this isn't the end of the story about the Rubik's cube. You can ask questions like, if you start with a cube and you shuffle it around, um, then you know that it's possible to get back to the solved condition by just undoing every move that you did. But it's possible that there are many, many, many sequences of moves that get you back to uh, the solved condition. So just because you took n moves to get there doesn't mean that there's not a way to do fewer than moves and moves to get back. So one question that got a lot of um, interest in this community was, take a cube, scramble it up as much as you want, and ask for the fewest number of moves to get back to the solved condition. So that's like the minimum path back to being solved. How large can that possibly be? Like, what's the most scrambled a cube can be in terms of the minimum number of moves to solve it being as large as possible? So this is something that, um, uh, has gotten a lot of attention. You can phrase this in terms of what's called uh, a Cayley graph associated to a group where you have a generating set and you let the elements of the group be the vertices of uh, the graph. And then you connect one to the other with a directed edge. If there's a way to go from one group element to another using an element of your generating set. So in some sense, this question that I asked is about the uh, what's called the diameter of this Cayley graph. So the longest um, path between uh, vertices. Or, yeah. So, okay. Uh, that's all I want to say about the Rubik's cube. So I'm going to pause and then I'll talk about the very last one of these puzzles uh, that I'll mention today. The last puzzle I want to talk about today is called Lights Out. And it's the last big section of this book. The way that it works is you have this uh, grid of lights that can either be on or off. And when you click a space, it changes the status of the space that you clicked and also all of its north, south, east, west neighbors. So, you know, if you click in the corner, you turn on the lower left corner light, and also the one above it and the one to the right. Then maybe you click the light that's off, that's diagonally up from it, and it'll turn this one on, but turn the up, down, left, right neighbors off. And the idea is, uh, here we'll reset, you can just choose some collection of lights, and your goal is to turn the lights out. So you choose some sequence of lights to toggle, and at the end of the day, you want to take all of the lights and turn them out. And this is not about a set of permutations in the same way as the previous puzzle. Oh no, I thought I had this one. Uh, 
but it's still related to the material that we've been talking about in this class. So, uh, okay, so what's going on? So let me first point out, if you turn on a light and then you hit the same light, it's like you didn't do anything at all, right? So if you toggle a light twice, it's like you did nothing. So any puzzle, whether you can turn it on or whether you can solve it, uh, a solution is just going to be a subset of the 25 uh, spots in the grid telling you which lights to pick. Why a subset and not like an ordered set? Because if you turn on one light and then turn on another light, that's the same thing as if you did the second light first and the first light second. So there's an abelianness to what's going on here. So one nice way to think about lights out is as a linear algebra problem, but where your entries are in Z mod 2Z. So what does it mean to click this light? Let's say we're going to use 1 for on and 0 for off. This is like a matrix, a 5 by 5 matrix, which has 1s in the three lower, right lower left positions right here, and 0s everywhere else. And so that's one matrix. Here's another matrix. If I hit both of these lights, that's like adding this first matrix to the second matrix. Because if the light gets toggled twice, that's like getting a 1 plus 1, which is 0 in Z mod 2Z. So one way to think about this problem is we're saying, here are 25 special matrices in uh, uh, 5 by 5 matrices with entries in Z mod 2Z. And we want to see what happens when we take the additive subgroup generated by these 25 matrices. One question is, do you get every matrix, every 5 by 5 matrix, with entries in Z mod 2Z? If you don't, how do you describe the set of the ones that you do get? So uh, it's definitely a subgroup, because it's generated by 25 particular matrices. But which subgroup is it? OK, so there's another uh, really nice way to describe what's going on here that's explained on the Lights Out page of this course website, which is you can think about this as a, an additive problem about 5 by 5 matrices with entries in Z mod 2Z. But you can also think about this as a nice linear algebra problem, where uh, what are we looking for? Uh, let me go into the book. So what are we looking for? We have some set of these special matrices. And we want a description of, in order to get to some particular 5 by 5 matrix, which lights do we turn on and which lights do we turn off? So there is uh, a nice way to set this up that what you're asking for is a linear combination of these 25 particular matrices where the coefficients are in Z mod 2Z. You're either taking one times yes, toggle this light, or zero, don't toggle this light. So uh, you're solving something of the form some giant matrix A times some vector of unknowns equals some 5 by 5 matrix. But you can represent that 5 by 5 matrix as a column vector of size 25. So you have this, uh, let me look for a good solution here. Um, yeah, you have this 25 by 25 lights out matrix A that is encoding these uh, blocks that have this special matrix. Um, each of these 25 special 5 by 5 matrices. And then this uh, column vector of size 25 that's going to keep track of which lights you turn on and which lights you turn off. And then B is going to be like your goal um, light configuration that you're trying to get to. And just by computing the rank of this lights out matrix, you can see that it's not 25. It's actually 23, which means that the probability that you uh, pick a random configuration of lights 
that it is solvable given the lights out moves is one out of four. It's two to the 23rd over two to the 25th. So this is just one example of a big class of problems like this. You can imagine changing the size of the board or changing exactly how the light uh, moves work. Like instead of having um, just on or off configurations, there are all of these variations that you could play around with. Like for example, maybe instead of just on and off, there's off, red, and green. Um, so you can mess around with this. You can see how it relates to all sorts of interesting linear algebra over finite fields. So there's so much more that you can see in this permutation puzzles book. I just wanted to give you like a quick intro to these ideas that uh, come from puzzles and games, but use all sorts of things from group theory that we've been talking about for the first part of this course.